Welcome. Let's discuss the open-ended questions for the geometry regions for June 2023. In question 25, we are being given a triangle ABC, which we have it here in the figure below. And what we would like to do is using our compass and a straight edge, let's construct the altitude from C to the line of AB. So let's get our compass and a straight edge and perform this construction. So let's identify the point that we want the altitude to pass through. And what we will do, we're going to get our compass and place the metal leg in our point C. And now we want to open our compass in such a way that I'm going to be intersecting at two locations in the line of AB, the line where we want our altitude to be at. So let me just close it a little bit more. Because now, when I close it, notice that when I perform a movement in my compass, I am intersecting the line of AB at two different locations, at here and at here. And now we're halfway done. Because what we would like to do is get our compass and place it in one of those green intersections. And now, let me move my compass and measure the full length between those two intersections. I'm going to close it a little bit. I want more than half the distance between them two. This sounds about right. And what we will do now, now that we have this measurement, let me move my compass to the bottom and perform a notation. And let me do the same with the other intersection in line AB. Let me not change the length of my compass. Let me just move it to the other intersection. And I'm going to see where do I intersect the previous mark that I made, which is about here. And we are done. Because now when I consider the point of intersection between those two marks, when I connect it to the point of C, this gray line is our altitude. It is an intersection of 90 degrees with the line segment of AB. Let's take a look. At the next question. In question 26, we're given two triangles triangle ABC, which is a one on top, and triangle DEF, which is the one in the bottom. And what we would like to think about is can we describe a sequence of transformations that will map ABC into DEF? So we want to think of actions that we can do to triangle ABC so that it maps into triangle DEF. This triangle here in the top, we want to do something to it so that it ends up being triangle DEF. We got to figure out that sum. Let's start by identifying corresponding angles. The way that we name triangle ABC has a relationship with the way that we name triangle DEF. The first letter in ABC should map with the first letter of DEF. So let me show that A in green and D in green. And also the second letter in ABC, which is B, should map the second letter in DEF, which is E. So B should map to E. And the third letter of ABC, which is C, should map to the third letter of DEF, which is F. So C should map to F. Well, one way that I can see this happening, it's by looking at triangle ABC and move it four units to the right and four units down. So if I move point C four units to the right and four units down, I'm going to land at this location. Let me call it C prime. This point of B, if I move it four to the right and four down, it's going to land at this specific location. Let me call it B prime. And this point of A, if I move it four to the right and four down, it's actually going to land on the same location that we have for D. So let me call this A prime. So let's draw our new triangle here in red. Now, how about if we fix this point D that we have here? Let's get this red triangle and then let's rotate it 90 degrees. 
in a clockwise direction. Well, when we do that, this point of B, when we rotate it 90 degrees, is going to land at the location of E. And this point of C prime, when we rotate it 90 degrees, it's going to land at the location of F. So we will be done with the transformations that are needed. The first transformation, we perform a translation of four units to the right and four units down. In the second transformation, we perform a rotation of 90 degrees in a clockwise direction around point D. And I do would like to point out that this is not the only answer. There's different combinations that could occur. This is just one example that I was able to see. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 27, we have a line segment PQ where the endpoints of P are negative 5, 1 and Q at 5, 6. And then in addition, we have some point R on this line segment of PQ. So let's start by drawing this line segment. So let me just rough sketch this location. Negative 5, 1 will be somewhere around here. And 5, 6, it will be somewhere over here in the first quadrant. Now let's connect those points to create the line segment in this question. And R is just some point in this line. But R is not just any point. It is a point that creates a ratio of 2 to 3 between PR and RQ. So now let's think about what that means. Well, if the whole line segment it gets cut in a ratio to 2 to 3, then the line segment is cut into 5 equal parts. So let's cut this line segment. And now let's say that R it's in this location. So now notice that PR it has two of those equal parts and RQ it has three of those equal parts. So now we have to find the precise location of R. Now what we would like to do is define it as a coordinate point. One way to make this happen is don't look at PQ as a diagonal line, but look at PQ as a combination of a horizontal and a vertical line. Because the same way that PQ got cut into five different pieces, we are going to cut the horizontal line in five equal pieces as well. And we will do the same for the vertical line. Now, let's find the length of the whole horizontal section. Well, that is the difference between the x values. So if I start the x value of negative 5, and I go to the x value of positive 5, I have traveled a total of 10 units. Well, that will be the length of the horizontal section. And now to find the length of the vertical section, let's find the difference of the y's. If I start at the y value of positive 1, and I go to the y value of positive 6, I need to travel 5 units. So that is the total length of the vertical line. Now let's try to see if we can identify the length of each of those small sections of the horizontal line. Well, the total length is 10. And if I want 5 equal pieces, then each horizontal length it will be equal to 10 divided by 5, which is equal to 2. And now let's do the same for the vertical line. Let's think about how we can find the length of each of those 5 equal pieces that we have here. Well, the total length was 5. So if I want 5 equal pieces, then each vertical piece, it will be equal to 5 divided by 5. 
So let's put that information in our diagram. So now that we have all this information, let's precisely find the location of R. That if we start at the coordinate point that we had for P, and we move two horizontal pieces to the right, and we move two horizontal pieces going up, I am going to define the location of R. But if I'm moving two horizontal pieces and each piece has a length of two, then I'm moving a total of four units to the right. And if I'm traveling two pieces going up and each piece has a length of one, then I'm traveling a total length of two units up. So now we can define the location of R. It is the starting x value of P. And then we're going to add four units to it. Because if we move into the right, we are adding x values. And that's going to give me the x coordinate of point R. And to find the y coordinate of point R, let's start with the y value of point P, which is 1. And now, because I'm moving up two units, I'm going to add two values to the y's. And when we simplify this, R has a location of negative 1, comma 3. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 28, we have a circle that has a radius of 6.4 inches. So let's start by drawing that. So here we have our circle. And now let's consider the radius. And it's going to have a length of 6.4. And what we'd like to do is determine the area of a sector that is created when we consider a measurement of 80 degrees. So let's visualize that. So from the line that we had for our radius, let's say that this is about 80 degrees of rotation. Then we're going to have a line somewhere in here. We want to know what will be the area of this section in blue. What we can do, we can find the area of the whole circle. And then multiply times the section that we want. And the section is determined by the angle that we are using to create this section divided by the whole circle, which is 360 degrees. So now let's place down that information. The area of a circle is pi r squared. And we're interested on a section created by 80 degrees. So we will have 80 divided by. 360. And now the only thing that we need to plug in, it is the value of our radius, which in this case is 6.4. And when we plug this in any graphing calculator, we're going to get an approximation of 29. But remembering that we are given inches as a measurement, then the area is inches squared. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 29, we want to consider a snowman that it's made out of three spherical snowballs with a radii of one, two, and three feet. Well, to start with, this term of radii, this is just plural or radius. So let's draw this snowman. So let's draw the head of our snowman, followed by the middle section, followed by the bottom section. And what we are saying is that the sphere in the top, it has a radius of 1. The sphere in the middle, it has a radius of 2. And the sphere in the bottom, it has a radius of 3. Now, when we continue reading, we're interested on finding the amount of snow in cubic feet that is used to make this snowman. In other words, we need to find the volume of the snowman. Well, let's not forget that each of the sections of this snowman, it is a sphere. So the strategy here, 
let's find the volume for each piece and let's add them up to get the volume of the full nomen. Well, remember that the volume for a sphere is 4 divided by 3 pi r cubed. So for the upper section that we have here, the volume, it's equivalent to 4 over 3 pi, the radius is 1, so we'll have 1 cube. The section that we have in the middle, the volume, it's 4 over 3 pi, now the radius is 2, so we'll have 2 cube. And the third section that we have here, it is equivalent to 4 over 3 pi times, where the radius is 3. Now the upper section, when we simplify it, that is going to give us 4 over 3 pi. The middle section, when we simplify it, that's going to give us 32 pi divided by 3. And the bottom section, when we simplify it, that is going to give us 108 pi divided by 3. So the total volume is the addition of this 3. 4 over 3 pi plus 32 pi divided by 3 plus 108 pi divided by 3. And when I simplify all this, this is equivalent to 48 pi. But because this is volume and the measurements were given to us in feet, then the unit is feet cubed. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 30, we are being given the diagram of a triangle ACB, which we have it here. But notice that is a right triangle. Angle of C is equivalent to 90 degrees. And then in addition, we also have the altitude of CD, which we have it here. And if it's the altitude, Notice that the intersection, it's of 90 degrees as well. And what we would like to do is to determine the length of the line segment AB. So this is what we're looking for. But this is a very specific scenario. Because any time that we have a right triangle, and we also have the altitude of this right triangle, we have a relationship between the triangles that we create in this situation. The right triangle in the left. The right triangle in the right. And the right triangle that we are given. So let's review those relationships. There are three. So let me draw the diagram that we are given to state those relationships. And the three scenarios that we will consider are in terms of proportion between the sides of the figure. In the first scenario, when we consider the altitude of the right triangle, we can consider it as a geometric mean. We can place it on the bottom left and the upper right. And that is a geometric mean between the line segment of AC and db. So ad, we can place it here, and db, we can place it here. This is always true. And also, when we consider the left side of this figure, it's a geometric mean. We can place it on the bottom left and the upper right. Between the left section of the hypotenuse and the whole hypotenuse. So ad, let's place it here. And a, b, let's place it here. And also, we have a geometric mean in the other side of our figure, c, b. So let's place it on the bottom left and the upper right. And c, b has a geometric mean between the right-hand side of the hypotenuse and the whole hypotenuse. So d, b, let's place it here. And a, b, let's place it here. And now we just got to figure out which of the three scenarios we have in this problem. 
But scenario two will be the best scenario to use. Because notice that AC, it's a measurement that we are given. AD, it's a measurement that we're also given. And AB, it is what we're looking for. So now it's just a matter of plugging that information in the proportions that we have stated below. So we'll have AD over AC. And that is equal to AC over AB. Well, AD has a measurement of 2. AC has a measurement of 6. And AB, it's what we're looking for. So now it's just a matter of solving for AB. We can perform cross multiplication. And we will have 2 times AB, and that will be equal to 36. And when we divide it by 2, then we're going to get that AB has a measurement of 18. In question 31, we have a triangle RST, where R is at negative 3, negative 2, S is at 3, comma 2, and T is at 4, comma, negative 4. So let's visualize this triangle. So point R of negative 3, comma, negative 2, it should be somewhere around here. Point S at 3, comma, 2, it should be somewhere around here. And point T at 4, comma, negative 4, it should be somewhere around here. So now let's create our triangle. And now for the line that is parallel to RT, where RT is down here, when it passes through point S, it looks something like this. So this is the objective. What is the equation of this line? Well, let's talk about strategies. If we want two lines to be parallel, they need to have the same slope. So let's start by finding the slope of RT. So we will subtract the y's, negative 2 minus negative 4. And now let's subtract the value of x's, negative 3 minus positive 4. And on the numerator, we're going to get a value of 2. And the denominator, we're going to get negative 7, which is equal to negative 2 over 7. So now we have all the information that is needed to define the parallel line. Because the equation of any line, we can define it as y minus y1 times m, x minus x1. And what we need are the value of m, which is the slope, and some coordinate point, x1 and y1. But we have that information because the slope that we want to use, it is the slope of rt. We want to make sure that the two lines are parallel. And if we want to make sure that the equation passes through point S, well, let's use the coordinate point for S, 3, 2. So now it's just a matter of plugging that information. For M, let's place the value of negative 2 over 7. And for x1 and y1, let's plug in the value of 3 and 2. So now we are done. We do not need to simplify our result because notice that the, in the instructions, it doesn't say simplify your equation. So what we have here, it is the equation of a line that is parallel to RT. And it also passes through point S. In question 32, we have that there is a rocket that is getting launched into space. And this launch, it is modeled by the diagram below. The one that we have here on the bottom right hand side. Now there is a person viewing the launch right at point of A. 
which is about here. So let's draw that person. And this person is 3,280 feet away from the launch pad. So at point B is where we have our launch pad, and the distance is of 3,280 feet. So let's draw the rocket from the launch pad. So here we have a rocket exactly at B. And if we continue reading, we have that after the rocket was seen at the point of C, which is about here, with an angle of elevation of 15 degrees. Well, the angle of elevation, it is the angle distance from the floor all the way up to our point of view. So this is where we're going to find 15 degrees of elevation. Now, after some time that the rocket was in this space, exactly at point D, which we have it here, we obtain an angle of elevation of 31 degrees. So if we look at the angle created from the floor and the point of view of the person all the way to the point where we have our second observation in the rocket, we are going to get 31 degrees in here. What we want to do, we want to determine the nearest foot, the distance the rocket travel between those two points of observation, C and D. So we want to know what is the distance between point D and point C. Let me call that D for the distance that we're looking for. Now let's break this down into the two observations that we were given. Our first observation was from the point of view of the person all the way up point C. But notice that when we connect point C and D, we are creating a right triangle here in the bottom. So let's draw this right triangle. And remember that point A, that's where we are looking at the rocket. Now let's place the information that we know about this figure. We have that our angle of elevation was 15 degrees, and we had a distance between point A and point B of 3,280 feet. Well, at point B, this is where we're going to have our rocket. How about we try to figure out what is the total distance that the rocket has traveled from the floor all the way up to point C? Well, notice that we are trying to figure out one side of a right triangle. We can use trigonometric functions. Now let's try to figure out what function we would like to use. Let's label our right triangle. The angle that is in front of a point of observation, that will be our opposite side. The angle that is in front of 90 degrees, that's our hypotenuse. And what is left, it's our adjacent. So notice that we are looking for the opposite when we have information about the adjacent. And that narrows it down the tangent function. Because remember that tangent of any angle is opposite over adjacent. So let's plug this information. The tangent of 15 degrees. Let me actually move my rocket because I want to have some space to say that I am going to be labeling the opposite as a value of x. So here we're going to have opposite as x divided by the adjacent, which we know it as 3280. So now let's solve for x, the left hand side. Let's place it over 1. And that way we can create cross multiplications. Let's place it down here. x times 1, that is going to be equal to 3280 times the tangent of 15. So here we have that x is equivalent to 3280 times the tangent of 15. And when we place this in our graphing calculator, we're going to get 878.9. Now let's consider our second observation, the one that we had at point D. Notice that we can also create another right triangle. Let's draw that triangle. And remember that here on the right hand side, this is where we get our rocket. And on the left hand side, this is our observation. Now we had an angle of elevation of 31 degrees. Now the distance, it is still the same, 3280. So how about we figured out what is the total distance that our rocket travels going upward? We have the same scenario as observation one. We are looking for one side of a right triangle. We can use 
trigonometric functions. We're going to have the same labeling as our first observation. The vertical side, it is the opposite. Here we have our hypotenuse and here we have our adjacent. So notice that we're looking for the opposite. When we have the adjacent, we can use a tangent function. So we are going to have the tangent of 31. Now let me move my rocket because I want to name this other length. Let me just call it y. Then we're going to have opposite over adjacent, which will be y over 3280. So now the left hand side, let's put it over 1. And when we perform the cross multiplication as we did in observation 1, we're going to end up with the expression that y is equivalent to 3280 times the tangent of 31. And when we place this in our graphing calculator, y, it has an approximation of 1970.8. So now let's think how useful this information is. The section of DC, it's what we're looking for. Distance between the point C and D. Well, we know that the distance from C to B found it to be 878.9. And the distance from D to B, which is where we have this whole thing, we found it to be of 1970.8. So if we want to find DC, notice that we can get the whole length divided by the bottom length. So we're going to get 1970.8 minus 878.9. And this value, it's equivalent to approximately 1,092 feet. So we can say that the distance between C and D, it's of 1,092 feet. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 33, we have a small can of soup in the form of a right circular cylinder. Now this cylinder has a base of a diameter of 7 centimeters and a height of 9 centimeters. And then in addition, we have a large container that is also in the shape of a right circular cylinder. But now this second cylinder has a diameter of 9 centimeters and a height of 13 centimeters. So let's start by drawing those right circular cylinders. On the left, let's draw the small can of soup. And on the right, let's draw the large container. Now the diameter is of 7 centimeters. And the height is of 9 centimeters. Now let's draw the large container. We have a diameter of 9 centimeters. And we have a height of 13 centimeters. Now what we would like to do is find the volume of the small can and also find the volume of the large container. Well, to find the volume, of a right singular cylinder that is equivalent to pi r squared times the height. It is the area of the base, but notice that our base is it's a circle. So that's why this is the area of a circle. Well, times the height. Well, let me actually move my figures to the left to make some space. Well, let's start by finding the volume of the small can of soup. The volume is equivalent to pi times r, but the value of r, it is the radius of the circle. Well, our diameter is 7. Therefore, the radius is half of that. So we will have 3.5 square times the height of our cylinder, which we know it as 9. When we put this down in our graphing calculator, we're going to get 346 centimeter cube. So now we have found the volume of the small can of soup. So now for the large cylinder, we'll have pi times r. The diameter is 9. 
the radius is half of that. So we will have 4.5 square times the height. But the height is 13. And when we put this down in a graphing calculator, we're going to get 827 centimeters cubed. We are done with the first task. The volume of the small can is of 346 centimeters cubed. And the volume of the large container, that's 827 centimeters cubed. Question 33, it has a second part. We also want to figure it out what is the minimum number of small cans that can be open to fill the large container? Well, let's think of a strategy. Well, we know the volume of the small can. And then in addition, we know the volume of the large container. So if we want to figure out how many small cans fit into the large container, let's divide the volume of those two. The volume of the large container in the numerator and then let's divide it by the volume of the small cans. When we perform this division, we're going to figure it out how many small cans actually can fit into a large container. So we're going to get 827 centimeters cubed divided by 346 centimeters cubed. And when we perform this division, we're going to get 2.4. Now let's think of this result. We are saying that we need exactly 2.4 small cans to fill a large container. But we want to figure out what is the minimum number of small cans. So you need 2.4 minimum. But for you to get 2.4, you need to buy 3. It just so happens that the third one is going to be around half of it. So that's our final conclusion. We actually need 3 cans. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 34, we have a parallelogram MATH, where the coordinate points of M is at negative 7, negative 2, A, it's at 0, 4, T, it's at 9, 2, and H, it's at 2, comma, negative 4. And with this information, what we would like to do is first, we want to show that the parallelogram of MATH, it's a rhombus, and then we want to find the area of that parallelogram. So let's take it one step at a time. Let's concentrate on the first task. If we want to show that MATH, it is a rhombus, we have to show the definition of a rhombus. Well, a rhombus, it's a figure where all sides are equal to each other. So that's our strategy. Let's start by plotting all these points that we are being given. And then let's show that the sides that are created are of equal length. So let's plot those points. M at negative 7, comma, negative 2. It should be somewhere around here. A at 0, 4. It should be somewhere around here. T at 9, 2. It should be somewhere around here. And H at 2, negative 4. It should be somewhere around here. So now let's connect those points to define the parallelogram of MATH. So this figure is definitely not drawn to scale, so let's just be mindful of that. But these are the four sides that we want to show that they are equal to each other. Well, one way that we can find that length is by choosing two points and then using the distance formula. But that's going to be a lot of work. We will have to use the distance formula once, two, three, in four times. That's going to be a long calculation. So how about we consider the vertical and horizontal distance among two points? If I find the vertical and horizontal distance of A and T, I'm going to move some units to the left and some units down. 
And the same can be said if I find the vertical and horizontal distance of the other two points. I need to move some units down and some units to the left. And now I can do the same for H and M, some units to the left and some units down. And the same for M and A, some units to the left and some units down. And because we only consider vertical and horizontal movements, then we know that we have perpendicular lines among those purples. But why did I consider this right triangles? Because this is going to help us simplify the calculation. Because notice that when I consider the length of MA, now I can think of this line segment as a part of a right triangle. And I can find the lengths of those sides to find this section on the top. Well, that is the difference of the x values. If I start at negative 7 and I go to 0, I am traveling 7 units. So we know that this length, it's up 7. And to find this vertical distance, I need to find the difference of the y values. If I start at negative 2 and I go to 4, I'm traveling 6 units. And now we can use the Pythagorean theorem. To find the length of M8, we will have 7 squared plus 6 squared that is equal to, let me call this x so I can refer to it as x squared. And 7 squared is 49. And 6 squared is 36. So we'll have x squared. And now we'll have that x squared is equal to 85. So now we can say that x is equivalent to the square root of 85. We have simplified our calculation. Now I can say that the length of MA it is equal to the square root of 85. So now let's move on to the next side, AT. Let me consider this right triangle. Well, to find the horizontal length that we have from here to here, let's find the difference of x's. If I start at 0 and I go to 9, that length is of 9. And to find this vertical length, if I start at 4 and I go to 2, I'm traveling two units. So now let's use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side of AT. This section was 9, this section was 2. Now let's find the length of AT. Then we will have that 9 squared plus 2 squared, it is equals to x squared. For 9 squared is 81, 2 squared is 4. So we will have that x squared, it is equivalent to 85. Well, after some simplification, we can say that x is equivalent to the square root of 85. So let's put that in there. AT, it is the square root of 85. So we're getting closer because now we have shown there are two sides of the same length. I need to show all four. So now let's consider the next length, TH. Let me approach it the same way. Let me consider this right triangle that we have here. To find this horizontal length, let's find the difference of the axis. If I start at 2 and I go to 9, I need to travel 7 units. And to find this vertical distance, find the difference of the y's. If I go to 2 and I travel to negative 4, I am traveling 6 units. But notice that this triangle that we have here, it is the same triangle that we had on the upper left-hand side of size of 6 and 7. So no calculation is needed because we have it here. The length of x is also going to be the square root of 85. So now let's move on to the last section, the length of MH. Let's try to approach it the same way. Let's consider this right triangle that we have in here. Well, to find this vertical length, let's find the difference of the y's from negative 2 to negative 4. That is 2 units. And to find this horizontal distance, let's find the difference of the x from negative 7 to positive 2. That is 9 units. But notice that this triangle that we have in the bottom, it's the same one that we had here in the top. It is a right triangle with lengths of 9 and 2. And there is no need for us to do any calculation because we have it here. So the length of MH is also the square root of 85. So we are done with the first task. We have shown that the parallelogram, it's a rhombus because we have shown that every single side in this quadrilateral are of equal length, which is the definition of a rhombus.
Now let's concentrate on the next task. Let's try to think of how to find the area of this rhombus. Let me clean some of the work that we have done here because I need the space for the second task. Okay, so now let's think about how we're going to find the area of the rhombus, M-A-T-A, -A, which is the area that we have in here. Well, what we can do, we can consider the area of this outer rectangle. Because once we have the area of this rectangle, then I can take away the area of this triangle and also this other triangle and also this other triangle and also this other triangle. Because when we subtract all those areas from the rectangle, notice that we're just going to have the rhombus M-A-T-H. So that's our strategy. Let me call this triangle, triangle one. Let me call this triangle two, triangle three, and triangle four. So let's find each of those sections individually. The area of the rectangle, but well, that is going to be length times height, where the length is seven plus nine, which is 16, times where the height is six plus two which is 8, which is 128. Now let's find the area of triangle 1, what we have in here. Well, we can use the formula of a triangle, 1 half length times height, where the length is of a value of 7, and the height it is of a value of 6, which is equivalent to 21. Now let's concentrate on triangle 2, which we have over here. So we will have one half base times height, where the base is 9, and the height is 2, which is equivalent to 9. Now let's find the area of this third triangle, where the base is 6, and the height is 7. Well, we have that calculation. It is 21. Now let's find the area of this fourth triangle. The base is 2, and the height is 9. Well, we have that value. It is equivalent to 9. So now we are done. Because now we can say that the area of the rhombus M-A-T-H, it is the area of the rectangle, which is 128, minus all these four triangles that we had in here. Minus 21 minus 9, minus 21, minus another 9. And when we compute this, this is equivalent to 68. We do not know what units we use, so I'm going to call this unit square. Now let's take a look at the next question. In question 35, we are being given a quadrilateral ABCD, which we can see it here in the figure in the right. And we are being given all this extra information on this quadrilateral. So let's take it one statement at a time. AB is congruent to CD, where AB is here and CD is here. Let's put that in our diagram. In addition, AB is parallel CD. Let's put that in our diagram as well. Diagonals AC intersect at EF at G. So here we're just saying that we have two diagonals and they're intersecting at some point. And the last piece of information, it says that DE is congruent to BF, where DE, we have it here, and BF, we have it here. So when it comes to proofs, don't just jump into the proof. Start by labeling your figure, which is what we have done. Now let's take a look at what we want to prove. We want to show that G is the midpoint of EF. Let's visualize that. G it's right here. And EF, we have over here. Well, if G is the midpoint of EF, then EG should be congruent to GF. In other words, that diagonal, it's cut 
into two congruent parts. So now let's think of ways to make this happen. Well, one thing that I notice is that the line segment of EG, it is a section of this triangle EAG. And the section of GF, it is the section of another triangle CGF. Now with this observation, we can form a strategy. Let's try to show that we have two congruent triangles, the ones in orange, and when we show that they are congruent, then we can use the property that corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So now that we have a strategy, now let's try to make this happen. Let's create our statement and recent table. Our first statement, it's always the same. Whatever information that you are being given, just list it as your first statement. And the reason? Well, that was given. Now, if I want to show that I have two congruent triangles, I want to show that I have one of the following patterns, either side, 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 angle, angle, side, side, angle, side, or angle, side, angle. So let's try to find any congruent angles or any congruent sides in these two orange triangles. Well, I can see that I have two congruent angles right here, the ones in blue, AGE and FGC, they're vertical angles. So let me state that. Well, one thing to notice is that the quadrilateral ABCD it's actually a parallelogram. Notice that I have a pair of opposite congruent and parallel sides. That is one way of showing that we have a parallelogram. So let's state that. But how is this useful? Well, now that we know that we have a parallelogram, notice that when I consider the upper and the lower section and this diagonal of AC, I have alternate interior angles inside of the orange triangles. So let's state that. Angle EAG. is congruent to angle FCG. Well, notice that I can kind of start eliminating some of the options that I want to consider. When I take a look inside this orange triangle, notice that I have two congruent angles in each triangle. So perhaps I don't want to think about side, side, side. I have two congruent angles. Perhaps I don't want to think about side angle side. I have two congruent angles. So now maybe I just want to consider angle angle side or angle side angle. We have two congruent angles in those statements. Well, let's not forget that we have a parallelogram. And now when I consider the left side with the right side, they are congruent to each other. That's a property of a parallelogram. But remember that ED is congruent to BF. That's a given. So if the two yellow sides are congruent and I subtract congruent sections, then notice that what's going to be left, it's of equal length. EA will be congruent to FC. So let's state that in our proof. I'm going to say that AD was congruent to BC and we subtract equal segments. So 
So now notice what happens when we put this information in our diagram. We are done because now we can say that those two orange triangles are congruent by angle angle side. And knowing that I have two congruent triangles, then I can use corresponding parts of congruent triangles to say that EG is congruent to FG. Now we can say that G is the midpoint of EF. And the reason behind it is because EG was congruent to GF. Hello, if you would like to continue learning about mathematics, you can check out the videos on the left.